Well, welcome back to our Wednesday night Bible study. As always, my name is Kevin. Uh, so thank you for you guys as uh, you join us uh, each and every Wednesday night. As always, there are notes that go along with our study tonight. You can access those at fcclife.org. And also, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can go ahead. There's an F in the corner of your screen. Go ahead and do that. And you'll see all kinds of content from our uh, teaching pastors, myself, and also other Bible studies that we hope that can help you in your relationship with Christ. We are on chapter 31, and uh, there are also other uh, teachings on Isaiah. If you've not got around to those yet, we uh, invite you to look to those. Why is there only one God? And that's not just saying why is there only one way to heaven but why is there only one god why not a pantheon why not a council we live in a day and a world that loves team leadership why not have a council of gods that would rule over mankind why would not god if there was one god why would he not create subordinates that would help him rule that would be other gods when we think of a pantheon which is a many gods we think of the greek and roman pantheons with jupiter for the roman gods and also zeus for the greek gods that are kind of the head of the of the the pantheon and we see all the different uh stories that you have in greek mythology and yet if you really take a very close look at those close stories you'll see that primarily humans wrote them just to look like humans. The, the gods are uh, portrayed as vile, uh, violent, uh, uh, almost petty people who, if you do not bow the knee to them, uh, they pout and go off on their own. Not so the loving goodness and kessed love of Yahweh, the only true God. When we look here, in Isaiah 31, we look at God understanding and looking to that the, he is the only God that they can look to. Isaiah 31, 1 says this, what we'll be studying tonight. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and who depend on horses. They trust in the abundance of chariots and the large number of horsemen. They do not look to the Holy One of Israel. They do not seek the Lord. There's really only one Lord you can seek. Here's the main idea. God declares judgment of those who run to idols instead of running to the only one true God. We want to be those people who run to the only one true God. So we learn a lot from this short little chapter tonight. Father, I pray, Lord, that your words will be made true. And Lord, there's nothing that is super spiritual lord that makes them true there's no incantation this prayer does not add flavor life or power to your words there's no spell we chant lord we let the word be the word and we rely on the word we stand on the word we look to the word and lord we know that the word became flesh and dwelt among man in jesus as we look at this short little chapter father help us to gain some insights lord that will help us on our way to the celestial city, as John Bunyan wrote in the Pilgrim's Progress, as we make our way, Lord, may we wake, make it with our face towards you, loving you, basking in the sun and the radiance of your son's glory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at the passage tonight, there's several things that we want to look at. And I really like what Paul Tripp says in many of his books. Uh, Paul Tripp, I have found him to be an excellent author. Uh, he's a biblical counselor and uh, taught uh, one of my seminary classes, and I have just learned so much from this man's writing. Uh, I think I've read, I've read every one of his books so far. I think he's the only person that I can say that I've read every one of their, their works so far. Uh, he and Tim Keller are really two guys that I read quite a few. There's a few books by Keller I've not read yet, but I really enjoy these guys' writing. They really encourage me as a, as a pastor. Uh, he says this in, in Lost in the Middle, he says, one of the most dangerous delusions for each of us is the delusion of our own sovereignty. Think about that for a minute. That's a huge delusion. To think that you are autonomous in all your ways and your own sovereignty, that you can affect the world in whatever way you want, that you are the captain of your soul, you're the, 
You're the, uh, the, the, the herald of your own destiny. And one of the most dangerous idols is the idol of control. I mean, is this not what Israel is dealing with? There is something in the heart of us that we want to be in control. We can't stand to be out of control. And yet here you see the people of Israel, they're the same way. They want to control their destiny. Usually very controlling people are very fearful people. Let me say that one more time. Very controlling people are very fearful people. They fear the outcome. If they cannot get their hands around us on something and steer it and drive it, and some of us, we want to control things in a very aggressive manner. Some of us, we're so passive with our anxiety and our worry, and then some of us are just downright passive-aggressive when it comes to control. But it's one of the most dangerous idols that we can have. So here you go. You're going to see a couple of things now. this passage. One, uh, verses 1 through 3 as I read today. Woe to those who go down to Egypt. We've already seen that this, this understanding of going to Egypt for help and rely on horses. Now you're going to see what Egypt actually gives them. What, what, Egypt, what is so important about Egypt? Who trust in chariots because there are many and there are horsemen because they are strong. Do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he is wise and brings disaster. He does not call back his words. He will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are men and not God. And their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble, and he who is helped will fail. They will perish together. You're going to see very powerful things here. You know, we're often tempted to trust in idols instead of ourselves. So whatever that is, we saw from what Tripp was saying, the idol of control, maybe an idol of money, an idol of power, an idol of position, an idol of being liked, an idol of popularity. There's all kinds of idols. Now, many of us, of course, don't have a 90-foot idol like Nebuchadnezzar made, then say bow down to that. But we bow down to things all the time that are become idols in our life, whatever they are. There's just as many idols in my profession as there are in maybe what you do. There's all kinds of idols that are out there. And yet, we don't necessarily sometimes look to the idol of a country or to Egypt like this, but even where we live in the blessed United States of America, that can become an idol as well if we trust in it and its ideas other than Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the only one that we can place our trust in. You'll see here that King Hezekiah, to give you some understanding of what was going on in Israel's history, is he was determined to purify the country's religion. This was a determination of King Hezekiah. You remember way back when we started talking about Isaiah, that Isaiah was a friend of kings. He was around the king's court a lot. He was a man of noble birth. So he had an opportunity to be around these kings many times. Uzziah is a king that he's around, and here, of course, is Hezekiah. Hezekiah wanted to rid the people not only of the worship of all these other gods that would be even from Samaria all the way down to Jerusalem, but he wanted to make sure that the Asherah poles and even uh, the, the smaller things that would not look like idol worship, that it was actually rejected by the people of Israel. He spent a lot of time doing that. He wanted to get the pagan out of the practices. It's primarily what he wanted to do. And for, fortunately, his counselors run to Egypt for help by sending an envoy of gold. When they send this envoy of gold, they needed the wisdom of God. They just thought this is what we're going to do. They wanted to control the situation. You'll even see in these first three verses that they say, God, they didn't even ask me. They didn't even ask me about this. God gives wisdom to those who ask him. And, and in situations, even when we find this there of what Hezekiah and his counselors were in, Romans eleven thirty three 33 says about the wisdom of God, oh, the depths of riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. There's great wisdom there. James 1.5, one of my favorite verses on wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And who, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. And then Isaiah 19.11, if you remember back when we studied Isaiah 19, the princes of Zone are utterly foolish. The wisest counselors of Pharaoh give stupid counsel. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise and the son of ancient kings? We see that there is no wisdom in all these other countries. That doesn't mean that there's not 
intelligence or, or, or a daily act of wisdom, but a godly wisdom only comes from the throne of heaven and only from the throne of God. So when we understand this, and they didn't really seek God's way, they didn't seek his wisdom, they thought a Calvary will save us, the many chariots and the many riders that were there. But here it is. The Calvary is mere flesh, and the horses are not even spirit. They're not like God. We'll see that Jesus says that God is spirit out of John, um, and out of John chapter 4, and that God is spirit, that God we see the incarnation of God in the second person of the Trinity in Jesus Christ, but yet God is spirit. He's a spiritual being. And therefore, he does not strive with man all of his days. We are physical beings. We have a body, and that body is a good body. You will have a body in heaven if you are a believer. There will also be a body that is cast into the lake of fire that is physical indeed. And you have the soul and the body. The soul goes to be with the Lord at the time of death for believers. And yet, God at one time will reunite those those that body and that soul one day in a new body that will be able to worship him and enjoy him forever find out at his right hand there's pleasures forevermore when you see this in isaiah 31 3 he reminds them the egyptians they're men not god their horses are flesh and not spirit they can die they have an expiration date they can be killed in battle not god when the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble. So when the Lord enacts, your helpers will stumble. And probably some of the most haunting pictures of this is this. He who is helped will fall, and they will perish together. You know, the scriptures tell us that, that when the blind leads the blind, there's no one to help them because both fall into a pit. And this is actually the picture of what's happened to Israel. Israel is letting Egypt be the deliverer instead of God. And it's so funny that actually in their history... They were rescued from slavery from Egypt in the great Exodus, and now they're turning back to that country thinking that they can be the Savior. The irony of it is spectacular when you look at this. But how often, like a dog returns to his vomit, do we return to the same things, thinking that they will fulfill us, thinking that they will be there for us, and when they're really not. They're really not. So you're going to see here that the, the second thing I want you to see out of this passage is this is that the greatness of God is shown in his ability to destroy or deliver. Now, this is quite frightening when you think about this, that God is not only a deliverer, but he is a consuming fire at the same time. It shows the utter sovereignty of God in all things, at all times, at all places. So look what it says uh, as we begin uh, here in the passage. For thus the Lord says to me, as a lion or as a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against him, he is not terrified of their shouting or daunted at their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on his hill. Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. And we'll see that again. We've talked about that a lot, as we'll see that uh, later on as he protects Israel. And he will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. So the first picture of God is this lion who will not relent when the forces oppose him. When the shepherds come out, the lion's not scared. The lion doesn't run off. The lion is not spooked. No, he knows that he's there. He knows he's more powerful than those men. So the first picture of God is this, this devourer or this one who can bring judgment and no one can stop him from bringing judgment. The second picture, though, God is a mother eagle tending to its young, protecting its young. See, we see this, is that God is everything that we need. God will take vengeance on those who have not called upon his name. He will make every wrong right. He will wipe away every tear. He will make all things good once more. But he will also protect us during the time that we don't see. We see the chaos going on in the world. He, that is who God is. Why would we run to idols when we have everything that we need in God? So the greatness of God is shown in his ability to destroy or to deliver. Third thing is this, is that he actually, because of this, he calls to repentance these people to turn from their idols to believe in God. We see this in verses 6 and 7. It says, Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. For in that day, everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you. And the Assyrians shall fall by the sword, not of man, and a sword not of man shall devour him. Uh, as we look at this passage. 
Um, and he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror. His officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and whose furnace is Jerusalem. The greatness of God is seen in these verses. To really look over and to unearth, the call to repentance is to really turn, excuse me, uh, is to turn from their idol worship. In Isaiah 29, 13, we're reminded that was before, and the Lord said, because the people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, while well, their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is commanded, taught by man. There is no fear of God because there is no fear of what will happen uh, when we look to idols instead of him. Sometimes we think that God will not take his vengeance, yet he will. And so there's no fear of him. Because there is no fear of him, our hearts often will not go back to him. He doesn't want just our behavior like a mechanical robot. He wants our heart. And this is very important. He calls them. You see, the problem with the nation was not economic. The problem with the nation was not the rulers or the leadership or anything like that. The problem with the nation was at the very heart level. They looked to God and they found him wanting. And they looked to other people and found it was more abundant. So... What will happen because of all this? Well, Assyria will fall because of the word of the Lord. That's those last verses that we'll see. And the Assyrian shall fall by the sword, not of man. So it's not going to be the army of Egypt. It's not going to be Israel. It's not going to be any other nation. It will, they will fall by sword, but not a man's sword. And the sword, not of man, shall devour him. He shall flee from the sword. His young men shall be put, put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in labor in terror. And his officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So here it is. God has spoken. Syria will fall. The sovereign one who has the ability to defend and destroy. The one who has the ability to deliver and destroy. The one who is the judge, but is also the protector. Assyria will fall. Even though they encamp around Jerusalem, as we'll see later, they will fall. I like what it says in Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of you, your own poets, have said. For we are indeed his offspring. There's a common grace that we can see in the understanding of God's sovereign control in all things. And I hope as you look at the landscape of the world, or maybe your own personal landscape today, of what's going on in your life, circumstances can get out of control. And you, maybe, you know, we say, a phone call can change your life, and it possibly can. But God, in his divine, sovereign plan, not only orchestrates those things, but knows when and where they're going to happen. And for me, that is one of the most divine things about divinity. It's God's sovereignty in all things. Assyria will fall. It will. I don't know what you're facing today, but as you look at Isaiah 30, there is, uh, 31, there is only one true God. You can't put your hope in anybody else, in anything else. It will all fall because there's only actually one true God that lives and breathes and we have our being in. I pray that you found this impactful, a little shorter study tonight as we only looked at nine verses, but next week we'll look at uh, chapter 32 as we continue on, as we look at the king who will reign in righteousness as we march on all the way to Isaiah 66. As always, you can share with your friends as we look at these passages together and uh, there's notes uh, that you can go back, rewind. And I, I mention this sometimes. If there's a question you have about the text that we didn't cover or you just wonder about that, you can always email me at kwilson at fcclife.org. And love to answer any of those questions. Or you can put a comment there in our Facebook feed, or excuse me, our YouTube channel. And one of our staff will get those to me and we'll help you with it. God bless. Hope you have a great day and a great Wednesday. And we'll see you next week.